Well, before we get started on actually how to reload the uh, 20 gauge slugs, I wanted to show you just some basics. Uh, so it's all in the same video. Uh, this is the Mech Junior, pretty standard reloading press. Um, and even though what I mainly use are the Premier hauls and uh, Winchester AA hauls, just for example, right now I got the Super X's just to show you how to deep prime and prime, which is really simple. But uh, this is how you do it. Before we get started actually doing the reloading of the shells, I wanted to just go over a few things about the, the lead, the casting, uh, the workbench. So the workbench first, a lot of ins and outs of doing it. A lot of people will say do this, don't do that, but it's going to come down to your own preferences, your own situations you might be in. Oh, there's Katie or Bagel again. Alright, there's your scratchings. She can't get enough scratchings, I tell you what. This is one dog that craves attention. I know pretty much all of them do, but we never had a dog like her that just, oh my, she wants scratched and petted almost 24-7. All right, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, again, with the workbench, for me, I brought this level up as high as I did. Uh, it allows my knees to come under because I'm in a wheelchair. We didn't just use nails and screws. When you're going to be using your press, you're going to be coming up and down hundreds and thousands of times. A lot of stress in and out, up and down. So what we did was we used 4x4 four four posts, 2x6 four boards. We didn't just nail it together, but uh, after we nailed it and just held it in place, we then came back with 3 8 carriage bolts and tightened her down and as the wood dried we came back and re-snugged the uh, nuts up. Now to the, uh, the lead and the casting, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, your lead for casting. A lot of people use wheel weights, uh, different things from x-rays and I've seen all kinds of things on the internet about it. What we were able to do, and we were very fortunate to come across, is at our local recycling place, uh, about 15 minutes from us. They're, one, they're about the only one in our area that will sell to the public, whereas most of them, they will not resell anything. Anything that you bring in to uh, recycle, they pay you so much per pound, but they will not sell it again to the general public. They have people that are contracted with them, and they, they're the only ones who have access to it after you turn it in. So we've asked many of them why they won't resell to the public and they, they will not give us a direct answer. So you can kind of imagine what's, why they're doing what they're doing and so uh, ain't much you can do about it unless you want to buy it off eBay but then you got a pretty expensive uh, process of uh, just Buying it by the pound, how much the shipping is. Some sellers will sell it in a flat rate shipping box, uh, others won't. And we've been selling on eBay for over four years. And we know that in the last couple years, USPS and FedEx give an online discount when you sell on eBay. So say you have something that ships for 20 bucks, we've had the reduction uh, because doing it on eBay and online from USPS, that was easily four bucks off of that. Well, onto the casting. Uh, like we said, this is the Lyman's. 20 gauge, 350 grain Sabo, and again, you're going to have people that call it a Sabot, a Sabo, and there might be a couple other pronunciations. Just for uh, here, we call it a Sabo. So here it is. You're going to uh, have your bottom pour spout, at least that's what I have, is the Lee 20 pound pot and you're going to get your mold up to temperature. It's going to take maybe a few times to get it hot to where when you pour it uh, and release it, it's going to fall out easily. And with this particular mold, uh, we had a lot of problems in the beginning because uh, Lyman's failed to give us any instructions. Now they're good at telling you things like 
how to care for it, how to prep it for your first castings, what lead to use, what not to use, but when it comes to actually casting the bullet itself and the technique, we didn't get anything with it. We bought this brand new through is either ballisticproducts.com or Missouri Bullet or um, I can't remember that other name, but um, it was brand new. Uh, we opened it up. You can see um, the person, you know, who put all this together, their signature and work number, and here's the instructions. Well, so-called instructions. And on this whole set of uh, instructions, there is nothing on it that tells you how to actually cast it and what technique you got to do to get it to work right. Now, they might say, or other people might come on here and comment and say, well, there's plenty of videos, and so that's why Lyman didn't do it, and uh, we totally disagree with that. There's no reason why the manufacturer of the mold cannot tell you how to use this. Lyman's has been around for decades. Um, they've been known for their quality, uh, well, just about any reloading supply they make, and so I see no reason for them not to let us know how to use this. And when I'm talking about using it, I'm referring to this one has uh, the little extra piece here. I, I forget what it's called, but uh, that's it right there. You're going to close your mold, stick this in, and then on your little E clip, there's a gap in between there that has to fit where the bolt or the little screw is on the bottom and then rotate it to hold it in place. Close the sprue plate and you're going to drop your lead down in when it fills up. Here's one of the keys, and since there's no instructions from Lyman on how to do it, uh, my wife went up and found the video, and we found two of them. One was by Fortune Cookie, and the other was by Elvis Ammo. My opinion, two of the top five um, reloading instructors on YouTube. It was very helpful. What they showed us was once you fill this up, you want enough uh, lead poured over the sprue plate that it acts as a uh, bonder or to hold it in place while you have to take this piece and spin it. What that does is uh, freeze up the bond between the lead and this and allows you to pull it out. So you're going to spin it, pull it out, Set this down, and in my case, I use aluminum pizza pan, so I ain't got to worry about it burning anything. Then you're going to take your wooden dowel rod, hit your sprue plate off, knock off the sprue, and open it up. If you got everything uh, just right, your temperature and your mold cleaned right, uh, the bullet will just fall right out. Other times, um, I have no idea why it sticks when I've had this... Uh, going and the bullets falling out no problem then all of a sudden not changing anything it all of a sudden wanted to stick and then I had to take and tap on the mold which I, I don't care to do but well if you got to do it you got to do it and what problems were we having before you figured out the technique from watching fortune cookie well the problem we were having before fortune cookie was uh, this piece right here um, I was trying to pull it straight out and uh, obviously it won't work when you pour your lead in it's going to form a bond um, to this piece and it will not let you just pull that straight out at least not all the different ways I've tried to do it and so uh, it is the definite key of when you pour that lead into the mold to take and twist this piece and again, uh, we'll go ahead and open this up and kind of show you. So, uh, I'll ask my wife if you can see this, or if I got to bring it closer. We got it closer now. All right. So the lead's going to come in and form all around this piece, forming the uh, the conical shape of your slug. And so when you turn this. The slug should stay still 
and then this will uh, release from it. And that's why I was saying earlier uh, to pour a little bit of extra lead uh, on top of here in the lead bonding to uh, the sprue plate is what helps hold the uh, slug in place that when you spin this piece the slug just don't keep spinning inside your mold which uh, oh, you'll start pulling hair before long because you can't figure it out but uh, alright we got it thanks to uh, this couple people on YouTube Tell you what, those people go through a lot to make these videos and uh, just the ins and outs and people asking questions, them coming back on and answering them and then uh, even create more videos based on uh, people's questions. And I really like uh, Fortune Cookie and uh, Elvis Ammo. They show a lot of the details that other people don't show and just kind of the details they expect you to know already. Whereas us being... Uh, uh, beginners at times uh, we, we need that extra info because uh, you know we don't know how to fill in the gaps and so let's get on to now the scale I believe now the scale uh, my wife loved me so much she actually let me to spend you ready for this $250. Now, we are on a budget, social uh, security disability, so it, it's not easy. We're, we're literally counting every penny we got. But after doing the research and after trying some of the other scales uh, and reading some other reviews, we, we just really wanted to go with this scale because it, it's very precise. It's well made. Uh, it was made in the USA back in the day, so we know we got a piece of quality that we don't have to worry that um, just poor manufacturing could ever result in um, just miscalculating the weight and causing a serious situation. So this is the RCBS 304 scale. Some people call it, and it might actually be called also the Dalamatic and this is a double beam and goes down to I believe the uh, tenth of a grain so what I did first oh I should show you also before I get into that let me show you uh, the Lyman load data because this is actually what I'm using here I'm not using online recipes and such I actually wanted to use what uh, is definitely guaranteed to be the load for it or at least one of the recommended loads for it. So right here is uh, Lyman's fourth edition. This is the one you do not want to buy. Even though it fooled me and many others by showing the Sabo round right here in a colored picture on the front cover And down below, it actually says the most up-to-date loading data available. Complete data listings for steel shot, buckshot, and slugs. Mm, excuse me. And again, shows the Sabo slug right here. Doesn't show a Foster slug. Shows a Sabo says in capital letters down here the most up-to-date loading data available complete data listings for steel shot buckshot and slugs but when you search through the book to find it the Sabo slug is not listed whatsoever but the foster slug is so why would you show the Sabo slug on the front cover and no picture of a foster slug say that it's got complete load data for the slugs but then only give load data for the foster we called the company and with uh, like other companies uh, if you call and ask why and why not they just responded by saying sorry for the inconvenience and just confirmed that it does not have load data in it for the Sabo but would not give an explanation as why they pictured it on the front, said there's complete load data for the slugs, and then never gave it. So this was $25 that we just had to uh, pretty much uh, just swallow. And, uh, well, 
At least now we we learned a lesson. Now this is the uh, Lineman's 5th edition. Um, let me uh, say again in case I didn't. Um, this is the Lineman Shot Shell Reloading Handbook, 4th edition. Okay, and now this is the 5th edition. The only way that I knew this had the load data in it that I was looking for was I went on YouTube and I found uh, a video. The guy was doing 12 gauge Sabo rounds by Lyman's. And he said he he used the fifth edition. So I let him know the situation with the fourth edition, and he told me that um, definitely the fifth edition has it. He actually went through his book for me and found it and uh, confirmed it, which I, I really appreciated him doing that. And so uh, the odd thing is, nowhere on the front does it say it has <laughs> the load data for the Sabo or show a picture of it, but uh, in this case, their 5th edition actually has it in it. So I'll go to that page. I believe I got it marked here. Okay, here we go. So, on page 392, I'll wait for uh, my wife to focus in on that if she can. I think we got it in there, Kev. Okay, I think we got her pretty good, so... This low data is uh, for using the Remington Premier STS plastic hulls, 20 gauge, 2 and 3 quarter. We're going to come down to the bottom. And I moved a little bit so she might need to refocus. There we go. So we got down here at the bottom 350 grain lineman Sabo slug for the uh, fold crimp. And what I liked about this is uh, I always use 800X. That's the high score IMR 800X powder for my shot shell loads. And in this case they're saying to use 21 grains for the charge. Winchester 209 primers and Winchester W double A 20 wads. Based on this, you're going to get it looks like 1460 for the velocity feet per seconds and oh 10,800 psi's. Okay, I think we can go ahead and continue on. I'm going to set these, let's see, over here. And, okay. So we got our, our powder. And again, that's the IMR High Score 800X smokeless powder. I've seen different people say to use different containers. Um, personally, I, I haven't found really anything that, that confirms whether you should use plastic over stainless steel or over another material. Um, the only thing that I would uh, think why they're specifying something different is maybe static in the material or moisture problems. But for right now, I've been using stainless steel and I haven't had any problems whatsoever. So we got our scale balanced out. I'm going to move this aside so you can see. One of the key things uh, when you have a scale like this, you're going to want a level surface. In our case, the floor was poured at a slant, so if it ever flooded, the water all aims toward uh, a drain we have. So when we put the workbench in, although the workbench itself is square, we still had to come underneath of it, put in shims, and make the, um, the, the top here level as can be. So that means our scale is level, 
functions more accurately. We got the balancer adjusted out. All of our slides uh, here are slid all the way to the left. The dowel is on zero. And as you can see, the pointers are almost exactly lined up to each other. Now the load data said to use 21 grains. We've already loaded about 10 of these and took them out and shot them. And I'll tell you what, those things kick like a mule. I'm not the biggest person, but even uh, my dad, who's you know twice the size of me, took and shot those. Wow, it, it, it gives too much of a kick in our opinion. For us, all we're using these for is home defense rounds, and we love to go down back, and we got a TV that blew up. Well, we're going to blow it up some more with our shotguns. So we ain't too concerned with precision, accuracy. We're not in competitions with these. Uh, we're, we're not hunting big game or deer at, uh, you know, long distances. And so instead of using 21 grains, we went down to 20. It might not have made a whole lot of difference, but we're hoping it just reduced the kick a little bit. So what I did first was I set my first slide here to 20. And so it's uh, 20 shown through the window and it's fell uh, evenly into its notches. And we're going to take our scoop and you can use a trickler. I have one of those up here. Oh, This is the Frankfurt Arsenal trickler and you'll see the little uh, adjustable table they put on this that you can raise into different notches depending on which trickler you have. You're going to set your trickler on here and then this allows you to fine tune very fine mounts of powder onto your scale and as you turn that the powder will slowly trickle down out and into your pan. But um, we're just doing shot shell and we don't have to be that exact. Maybe if we was doing like say competition or um, our pistol rounds and rifle rounds, we, we might get a little more precise on it. So we're going to put in some powder. And we see, excuse me, that we're just a few hairs below being uh, 20 grain. So I'm not going to worry about probably five or six little granules to put in there to make that perfectly even. And so what our charge is going to be is the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the Lee 2.2 cc powder scoop. So what I did to find that it was the 2.2 cc, after I put my powder in here and it came to 20 grain, I went through all my scoops and I poured the powder in them until it filled the scoop up closest to the top. And uh, that's the scoop I use. Okay, I think we can set that aside for now. I'm going to set this back on here. And get that out of the way. Okay, now on the reloading press, even though the book uh, recommends, and rightfully so, using the um, Premier STS hauls by Remington and the um, Winchester AA hauls. I got the Super X hauls just to show you uh, depriming and priming. But um, I don't recommend using these. Um, there's going to be variations of the hauls. Some have a solid hull, some have an insert down at the bottom, some have high brass, some have low, and you just got to... Uh, if you if you got particular hulls, you got to look up if that's recommended to be reloading with them, or if they're more of a one-time use and throw them away after you're done. So we got the Mac Junior here. It's set up for 20 gauge, and I've seen some people set their hull down on the base first and then bring down the handle. 
I've seen when you do 250 to 500 of these shells at a time and you get in a hurry and want to get it done, you don't always place the shell exactly in the right place every time. And sometimes when this comes down, it'll cock the shell sideways. And even though there's a starter on the deprimer, this doesn't always uh, line itself up. Most of the time it will, but I've caught a few times that it got hung up. So what I like to do is shove my haul right up into there and then pull down. We're going to give a moderate pull. It drops the primer down into your catch pan. And of course there's what you get. You get a haul that's been deprimed. And so we're going to go on to the second stage here. Uh, these are the Winchester uh, 209 primers for shot shells. You're going to set it down inside, of course, with the actual place that the firing pin hits. Down first. And again, I like to stick my hull up on the die and bring the hull down to it. And then press down and that should be all of it. I haven't had any trouble with the primer not seating itself all the way up in. This mech junior, the die itself, um, I don't think it has any adjustment on it. When you stick this up to the mounting plate and tighten down the screw, as well as when you stick in the actual piece that shoves the primer in, I'll take that apart real quick to show you what it does. I don't know if you can see that too well, but down inside has, oh, it looks like about a 5 16 um, dowel rod in there uh, formed at the bottom of this. So as the shell comes down over top and the primer is resting there, the two shove into each other. And there's a little spring in there that helps uh, push your uh, shell back up. And so there is no adjustment to that, and like I said, uh, even though there's no adjustment, they made it just right to where it presses that primer in, uh, seats it evenly every time. Different manufacturer primers, different hauls, you might have some problems, but uh, so far this has been flawless. Okay, uh, the next thing we're going to get into is uh, the actual putting the powder into the hauls. Um, maybe uh, just a little bit more on the actual Sabo slug and uh, the crimping and final crimp. So we're going to reset up the camera from a different angle so that you can see from this side where we where no oh, excuse me where we're going to be doing most of our work. All right, we set up with a new camera angle here. We can uh, see from this side what we're doing. First, I'm going to start off with. Uh, a lot of people are going to ask probably why ain't I using the powder charger up here that was made to uh, drop pre-measured uh, amounts of powder down into the hull. First uh, I'm going to take this off here, I'll pull this down so you can see. This ain't the original uh, charge bar that came with it. The original Mech Junior charge bar, um, if I can reach it I'll show you the difference. is this one right here and so you can you can see you know just the basic differences right here but um, one of the main differences is the original one for the Mac um, it has pre-drilled holes the holes uh, you have one on the right one on the left mm, excuse me the one on the right is for your powder and it's marked with a P up here. I don't know if that'll show because it's uh, uh, nickel plated and so it might have a glare on it. 
And the one on the left has an S, so that's for your shot. So you'd have your uh, lead BBs or lead shot up in this container and your powder in this one. This is a powder baffle. Uh, we can get into that another time. But um, since we're not using shot and we're using slugs, well, uh, this use for this is eliminated. And back to the charge bar. Uh, some of these I've even seen that sell different bushings. The different size bushings allow different uh, amounts of powder uh, for whatever application you're using. Myself, I don't like the different bushings you got to have and the different sizes. Uh, it makes it nice with this charge bar here that the dowels on the end af actually slide these uh, two bars in and out that creates larger and smaller spaces. And so the more you open this up and draws this back, the more powder or uh, shot that's going to drop in it and give you the same load each time. This one here, uh, what we liked about it, wasn't very expensive and it's made in Canada. Uh, it's not made in Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, China. Uh, and aside from Germany and the United States, we have found things we bought from Canada were actually quality made, uh, not just the workmanship, but uh, the materials in it too. And so I was very satisfied with this. Now, to the problem of why I don't use this also for the powder right now is I'm having problems with the Mech Junior and this charge bar. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, slide that back in and I'll get this out of the way. Now on my 12 gauge Mac Jr. I don't have this problem and I'll show you here the charge bar and this plate that's on the Mac reloader. Uh, let me see if I can hold that steady. There's about a 30 second gap from uh, the top of the charge bar into the bottom of this plate. A 30 second don't seem like much, but in this case causes huge problems. When you have your powder in here, and I don't know about other powders, but I definitely know with the IMR High Score 800X, it's, it's flake powder. They're actually little thin flakes, and so it's not ball powder or uh, any other type. And what happens is when you have your powder dropping down through here, after you slide this back and forth a couple times, the powder actually works its way in between the gap of the charge bar and this top piece here and it binds up and it makes it very difficult to shove this back and forth to where you end up having to take the thing back apart, powder ends up falling everywhere, makes a mess. And so um, in this case, we're just going to take and do it by hand and get her done. Now, as you can see, uh, the powder and the shot fall through this drop tube. They make these out of plastic. We bought the steel ones for longevity because this outer tube slides up and down on it. And after time, you're going to get wear on the plastic that wears it thin, might even uh, break through and create a hole. So uh, it's well worth, I think it was actually, we got it on a good deal for five bucks and like three bucks shipping. And so that, that ain't too bad, even on a budget. All right, let's get to the other thing. Um, well, no, first we're going to start dropping in our powder. And what I like to do is start with just about 10 shells at the most. I only do about 20. Other people are going to have their own preferences of what's proper, what's not. For my own views on this of uh, safety reasons, uh, I only like to do single row. I don't like to start putting in several rows, such as uh, like this. Um, what that creates, what I found was, uh, as you start going down through, if you start going side to side, you, you can lose track of which one you just charged and you can end up 
uh, worst case scenario, double charging a shell. If you don't charge a shell and you skipped it, well, that's the best case scenario. But uh, putting a double charge in, you can uh, destroy your gun. Uh, you can have uh, people hurt that's around you or even hurt yourself. And so this is, in my opinion, one of the most crucial points to make sure that each shell only gets one charge. And so that's particularly why I just only do one row. I can easily keep track of uh, what shell I was on and I'll show you just my, my technique which uh, like I say others are going to do it differently and uh, some will criticize, maybe not criticize, but um, it'll come down to when you reload yourself, how secure you are in your method and always getting the right load uh, each time. So we're going to take our little funnel and our powder scoop and now before I go to grab another scoop of powder I always move my funnel in the next one that needs to be charged this way it always keeps it in line to which one just got charged and the next one that has to be charged if you get out of sequence uh, it can start uh, creating confusion. It, things also like if the phone rings or your dog bothers you right in the middle or someone comes to the door, uh, you, you can get thrown off at where you was just at. And you can see I give it several taps and two, mainly two reasons. To make sure all the powder came out of the powder scoop and the funnel itself on this particular one the hole in the bottom is so small that with this powder, it'll sometimes bind up in there. And so I always give it several extra taps uh, to make sure all the powder fell out. What'd be nice is if they made a see-through funnel and then I would know every time I lifted my funnel back up that all the powder has dispensed. They, they might make them, uh, but myself, I haven't come across one yet. So this is just the next best thing. Oops, and I lost track of which one I was on, and so got to take a visual inspection, and it looks like we are on number five. So, nope, my chair's wandering on me. You're locked down here. So we just did number five, and uh, all right. You know what? I think that's good enough. You can see some of the ins and outs, and so let's get to the next step uh, my wife already got uh, a bunch of wads out the sabo slug set in them and as we said earlier the load data shows to use the winchester wwa 20 wads and it's right there at the bottom of the bag And so far we have not had any problems with these wads. When we did the 12 gauge Lee key drive slug, uh, it was the 7 8 ounce slug, we had a lot of problem uh, with the wads they said to use in the slug that the height of the slug was uh, down below the fingers of the wad. And you, you can see videos, uh, Fortune Cookie, Elvis Ammo and others will take certain wads and if they're up too high they'll take scissors and cut them off which is perfectly fine but I didn't want to have to go through uh, that lengthy process to do 250 to 500 wads so in this case we got lucky and the wad they recommended and the slug it's a nice fit when you shove in the slug you'll notice it goes down in and it you don't have to press it in and there ain't no slop at the base side to side. That means it's just uh, what it is, just a snug fit, not too tight, not too loose. And so with others, we've shoved the slug in and it actually flared out the sides of uh, the wad fingers. And what that caused was when we shoved it down into the hull, 
immediately noticed a bulge in our shell. We didn't know how much that affected until we actually chambered it into our 12 gauge pump and found oftentimes with that bulge it either wouldn't go into the chamber each time or if we got it into the chamber it was heck trying to get it pulled back out so we definitely uh, like these so much more now all of these uh, yeah been deep primed primed our powders in and so what we're going to do is start our wad and our slug down into the hull Everyone's going to have a different technique. Uh, some work better than others. Some have maybe a different uh, type of press or whatever to do it that makes it easier. But uh, so far what I've found, uh, just doing it by hand, you're going to uh, hold the shell and hold the wad at about a 45 or less, probably at yeah, less angle. And you're going to start one side of the wad in and give a little twist on this until it starts in and then finish pushing it in. Once you got it that far, all you need to do, and you ain't got to do this, well, <laughs> I can't shove it down because it's a little tight. So we're going to just leave it at that height and our press is going to do the rest of the work. So we're just going to do a few more here. Give it a little twist, force it in, and oh, we're good. Now, if my wife wasn't behind the camera, uh, we would be doing some multitasking here and uh, getting her done. She'd be over uh, at this station taking, after I charge every haul, she will pull those hauls away from uh, where I'm putting powder in to make sure I do not double charge a haul. And then from here, when she's got them set, she'll start all these wads in and then uh, just makes it so much more convenient. All right, we'll just do one more. Uh, so we're going to show the crimping process too, a couple times. Now, this is uh, what I was hoping to show you. Uh, some of these halls, for whatever reason, this area right here around the hall where the um, there's a recessed ring, and right there is where the actual wad folds over and does uh, the sealing or the crimp. Now, I have some of these, the wad goes down in with minimum pressure. I have some that go down in just, uh, just barely letting its own weight fall in. And then some are so tight that what happens is when you try to shove it in, this area here um, acts as like a cushioning agent between the hull or I'm sorry, the, the top of the hull where the slug goes and the base of the wad where it seats up against the powder. Let me grab one of these, maybe see better. So you can see where they uh, formed little pieces of plastic that bridge the gap. What I believe that that's for from what uh, some of the videos I've seen, um, that's a cushioning agent. So when you pull the trigger, the powder detonates this gap will close a little so you don't get so much kickback in it and so it actually cushions the shot but uh, what I found with these Winchester AA20 hulls is that area in between is in my opinion formed just a, a little on the the thin side so it doesn't make it just rigid enough so that when you have hulls like this that are a little tight when you try to shove it in that area that I was talking about starts deforming. It'll kink off to one side or it'll flare out and then um, it just deforms it and it no longer is at the same length. It's actually kind of crushed a little bit. It, it might not hurt nothing, I, I don't know, but um, I, I kind of like it, uh, the wad to stay the its same size and structure as, as when, when it started in. Okay, now coming to the reloader, we got to uh, seat the wad down into the right height. And what we're trying to get is the base of the wad right here that's going to seat against the powder to come down in and snugly press against the powder. 
Um, again, I, I don't know how technical this is. You, you can go online and research it, and uh, you'll find like I did. Some say it's uh, critical, some say it's moderate, some says it don't matter. So, who do you believe? Well, who knows? So, on the mech reloader, what I did, since uh, we already got our wad started, we're going to take and remove the little wad guide here. This just unscrews. It's got right-handed thread, so we're going to take her off of there. This piece here is for when you have shot shell. Uh, what's going to happen is, and I, I should have left that in, but I'll just show you real quick. Um, this is your third station. You're going to be seating your wad down in after you've pulled this down and it releases your powder charge down through the tube and into the base of your shell. Then you're going to take your wad, place here, and it's going to shove it down through the little fingers and into your hull. And it's going to seat it down against your powder. Left uh, up in your top of your wad is your shot shell that's going to also, like we said before, Come down through your charge bar, down through the tube, and fill up the top of your wad. But we ain't doing that, so we're going to set that aside. Oh. And this is what I use to, to seat this down in. So far, it, it's worked really nice. Oh, before I do that, I am going to say, uh, back when I was talking about the hulls not going down in good, um, let's see, right here, uh, of course, is your depriming station, and on your deprimer pin itself has a flared um, uh, base that goes up, and that's what helps uh, guide it into here. Now, when you shove your hull up on this, it... It's uh, not a real tight fit. Uh, it's barely even snug. In some cases, it's even got a couple thousands play. So that's not a, uh, much of a help, this coming down and opening that back up far enough to allow the wad to just easily be shoved in. No different than the primer. You can see how easy this just goes up and down. And so that's not really flaring it out that much to help uh, expand the plastic back out to where you can get the wad in easily. So bring her in under there. We want our slug, it don't have to be perfectly straight, but you want it somewhat straight so when it starts down in it don't start cocking sideways and, and getting all cattywampus. So. We're going to press down, and this is spring-loaded, so what happens is when you put a certain amount of pressure, uh, it starts, the spring starts collapsing, but you'll notice the pin didn't keep going down, or the die didn't keep pressing down, then all of a sudden with a certain amount of pressure, the spring will pop open and shove the slug in a little bit further. Now it's not an exact measurement on this, or a setting, that you just pull this down all the way till it stops and that perfectly seats it. You got to do some trial and error and in some cases look at the slug each time to see if it's went down as far as it should. So what you see me do, I only shove the slug down in uh, about a sixteenth of an inch from the top of the hull. So what we want is the top of the slug to come down below the um, the little crimp line here and it should be down below the crimp line by about a I'm gonna say about a sixteenth of an inch it won't hurt if it comes down a little further I haven't had any problems when it's come down a little further the only time I've had problems is when the slugs up way too high and you go to do the crimp process it, it can cause a little bit of uh, trial and error and having to uh, reset the slug down in a little further so let's get that down in where it should be just go easy. That didn't do her. That one did. Okay. Now when I shake that, um, I can't hear any 
of the powder shaking around so I know the base of the wad has seated snugly against the powder and um, shoved out all the air, uh, whatever else. I, I don't know if that makes a real big difference. Uh, you know, whether uh, actually shooting a slug or for long ter term storage, but I like it snugly against there so I don't hear no powder. Uh, <laughs> I don't hear no powder shaking around. And so now we got our slug in. It's right down below that little crimp line, and uh, we can go on to crimping. First, I'm going to do a couple more of uh, seating the wad in the slug. There we go. Okay. All right, so now we can go to the next station. I'm going to turn this a little sideways so I can just grab a hold of it better. This is the fourth station. It's going to be the uh, crimp starter. Just going to come down until the handle stops. And what you see is it started forming the crimp all the way around. Up inside here is a little, um, I'll call it a die and it's cupped upward so that when it starts coming down around the hull uh, the little indentations make this uh, crimp right here start to go into its form. So now we'll take it to the next station so after we've come down we just slide it straight back come down and we're gonna give a little bit of a firm press on that one and there you go, that's pretty much a perfect crimp. You can see how below uh, the top here where was the, uh, what's called the, I believe the crimp line, um, the actual little fingers of the top here have pressed down and recessed in by about maybe a 32nd or 16th of an inch. And so that's why I say the slug ought to come down below that by about a sixteenth of an inch so that when this is crimped down in uh, it comes down right on the top of the slug. take long at all and you can see that's a pretty nice crimp and uh, I don't know how well you can see um, it, very little to no bulge at all and uh, so far running these through our Mossberg 20 gauge pump we haven't had any problems with the jamming uh, extracting it any anything or a really nice load uh, now, whenever you got a helper like I do, we're going to be doing each station um, one at a time, meaning when we deprime, that's all we do is deprime the first station. While I'm pulling the handle, my wife is putting in and pulling out each shell and setting aside um, and for the next station. We might go through anywhere from like you said 250 to 500 and so we don't want to keep moving a shell around to a different station and having to perform different uh, steps we just want to get them all deprimed because we're in that rhythm in and out in and out and, and yes I rarely ever catch her finger <laughs> and so once we get our technique down we're both in rhythm oh it's sweet we can just start really spitting out the shells quick and so after that station, of course, uh, she starts uh, getting the primers 
and she'll have them set up in a row to where she can grab each primer easily and she'll set them in and she'll set the hull up in here and then from there all I gotta do is pull down release and then I'm the one who grabs the shell out and I set it off to the side and then she'll grab the other one feed it prime it and we set it off to the side from there now all the hulls are over here by the wads and the slugs we're going to then take and line up our um, shells um, and we'll uh, put the charge in them and then from there she'll feed all the wads and slugs into them and then we can start pressing each one uh, down into where it needs to go and then after that uh, we go to the fourth and fifth station and the fourth and fifth we do do all at one time because it is so fast to have your haul in pull this down shove straight back pull it down again and done well, I hope this helped you. Um, like I said, there ain't a whole lot of videos out there on the 350 grain Sabo. Maybe for 12 gauges and such, but none we could find on the 20 gauge. So, all right. You have a good day. Thanks.